Hi, everybody. I've got attorney Andrea Burkhart here again, and we have both seen Phoenix Rising, the Evan Rachel Wood documentary now in full. Um, I put a video out earlier today talking about some of my impressions. Um, I was curious, you know, what, what do you think as a lawyer, not as a lawyer, whatever, but what was your, what's your reaction to that? Yeah, I will definitely mention uh, my great skepticism at of this depiction of her uh, giving the statement to the FBI with <laughs> a entire documentary film crew there present and and recording. Now, in full disclosure, I don't do federal criminal work. It's not my not my purview. I don't regularly hang out with the FBI or, or do those types of interviews or anything. But that is just so lacking in credibility based on the way that law enforcement in general will tend to operate. And it's pretty well understood that uh, when it comes to criminal investigation, um, the FBI tends to be a lot more um, professional, dotting the I's, crossing the T's, thorough, etc., than just your average, you know, local small town police department. So from my perspective, if there's no chance in hell that a local small town police department <laughs> When we letting this go on, uh, there is zero chance that this was anything, any kind of accurate uh, representation of, of what actually happened. It was clearly a performance, a recreation at best. Um, but of course, based on Marilyn Manson's complaint, we have reason to believe that she never, in fact, reported anything to the FBI at all. Yeah, I think that's, I'm glad you said that because I think that that's really smart. I think that's really true. Uh, I, the, I, I would be skeptical too that anything was reported to the FBI either. But you know what was reported is the fake letter that they drew <laughs> impersonating an FBI, an FBI agent. I know that Manson's team did report that, right? We know that. And so <laughs> Evan Rachel Wood can be very glad that she now is involved, likely, in an FBI <laughs> investigation. <laughs> And she's going to have all the opportunity to tell her story that she could ever want. <laughs> well, you know, my personal first reaction to it was just kind of surprised at how freaking boring it was. Um, I had like an hour left to go. And I, I, you know, it was just getting to be a struggle to finish, you know, I'm like, when, when is something substantial going to be presented here? I'm getting a little tired of two hours of Evan Rachel Wood emoting and, uh, you know, sharing her internal processes as though, you know, that's all that the whole world wants to watch. Uh, it was like a vanity, it was like a vanity project, which I guess it is. It's like a really perverse vanity project. But yeah, I noticed like there were so many pointless scenes where it was just a vehicle for her to emote. Like, and they, you know, like she would get in the car and then it would just be like this really long scene of, of a close up of her face while she's driving that just goes on and on and you just see, and they cut away and they come back and it's still her face. <laughs> Yeah, and so much of that seemed to be so performative, you know, the like one of the ones that stood out for me um, was the the moment where she posted the the Twitter or Instagram or whatever it was where, where she she named Marilyn Manson. And so they make this whole video production of the act of posting a tweet, you know, and it just it just seemed um I don't know, uh, unnecessary and, and very unrealistic at certain points. Um, another one that, that stood out to me was um, when they, she was moving out of the house, you know, because they're threatened and, and scared and, and Il Magor is telling her, you know, you got to get out immediately. And so then there's just all this, you know, video camera footage of her packing her bags and checking, you know, it, it just... It does not strike a chord with me um, as a realistic depiction of somebody actually desperately fleeing out of here. <laughs> yeah, there wasn't a sense of urgency there. That's for sure that, that they, were, they were claiming there was. Um, 
and it, the, the movie really did, it really did need a good editor. That's for sure. Uh, they were really, they were really trying to stretch that out to get those, those, those two segments. Um, I think you said three, it was, it was two segments. It felt like three. <laughs> <laughs> it did. It just, it just wouldn't end. I'm yeah. like, how, how, when and how is this going to end? And is there going to be anything juicy at any point? And I was left deeply disappointed in that. Well, so that was the, the qu one question I was going to ask you. And then again, you know, whatever you want to talk about, but uh, what would you, because I, I felt like I, I was really feeling like toward the beginning, especially in part two, that to an unsophisticated viewer, this might be compelling just having all of these women sitting around commiserating with each other saying, oh yeah, I had the same experience. And then having that, that guy there, Dan Cleary, who I've, basically debunked on my channel elsewhere. I, but anyway, uh, but, but they're validating what they're saying. Um, but it really did feel like as it went on, it just kind of, it just kind of spun out. I, my question to you though, was, uh, you know, being charitable to the documentary, <laughs> what did you think was, uh, the, was there something that you thought was more compelling or where you're like, as an attorney, you're like, huh, that's, was there anything like that? Oh, sure. I mean, I think that we have to give it a lot of credit for being fairly effective propaganda. Um, I do think it's going to be pretty successful in persuading a lot of people who haven't looked into the details of, of this case. And um, obviously just certain things that um, were deliberately cherry picked that if you haven't followed it, you don't know about. Uh, a big omission that, that I saw um, was the lack of any um, acknowledgement of Evan Rachel Wood's own independent adoption of the Nazi regalia and mannerisms and so forth. Um, it, it, that one in particular jumped out at me um, because I do personally tend to theorize that one of the root causes of all of this is Evan's desire to avoid cancellation for that publicly documented history of uh. being Nazi friendly in, in the past. Um, that is absolutely the type of thing that in 2022 would come back and bite you unless you can make a credible case that Marilyn Manson forced you to do it. Uh, so yeah. I think this is an area that is of deep concern to her. Now, Again, that's something that she could have pitched in the documentary as evidence of his abuse and coercive control and all this stuff. Look, I'm this Jewish woman and he degraded me by forcing me to do those things. You know, she could have presented it in a way that uh, advanced her narrative. But I think the entire subject is so radioactive to her. She's so desperate to bury that, that they just, you know, decided to take the route of not mentioning it at all. So that's an obvious area of criticism that I think the documentary is, is potentially subject to. But again, it's, it's a situation where We've all seen the fake news that gets published and then the, you know, the retraction um, gets one tenth, one one hundredth of the circulation as, as the individual story. So there's really no reason for her to go ahead and and bring all that out to the fore, you know, in, in her in her um, exposition in this documentary, because you know, the, the amount of coverage the criticism gets is going to be minuscule in comparison. Right, right. That's true. Um, did you, did you see anything? I mean, uh, and do you see anything in the way of actual evidence? I mean, I know there was testimony, witness testimony and people talking about their supposed experiences with Manson. Did, did they present any evidence? The, the whole case is, is really pitched as a circumstantial one, right? Because yeah. um, it's, it's based on things like this ostensible old diary that she has, which is now going to be immediately discovered by Marilyn Manson in the civil suit. I don't know how smart that was, um, but whatever, this, this journal. Um, I, I, I remember seeing her having a, a sheet that looked like it was ostensibly supposed to be text messages from Marilyn Manson um, text but message. we didn't actually see it, right? With, but you didn't see actually it. see it. It was kind of blurred and it wasn't even, she didn't even necessarily take the step of like trying to represent it as these are actual text messages, you know? It's just this suggestive thing that's kind of there in the, in the imagery of, of the documentary. Um, 
text messages to her mother, obviously heavy reliance on the autobiography, um, mm-hmm. which again, this is, this is a circumstantial thing. This is, this is prosecution by smear, which is really the same thing that's going on with this, uh, you know, group therapy, the support group, um, type of, <laughs> of situation. It, it really is. Um, but it's very, very powerful. And it's something that, that he can't discount. Um, I did a, I did a short thread on, on Twitter about this exact same phenomenon. And what I was talking about in that context was the Chris Brown rape suit, um, that got thrown out. Well, it didn't get thrown out yet, but the lawyers backed away from it because all these text messages came to light that were very inconsistent with the claim that this was a non-consensual encounter. And what I pointed out is that this type of thought process is um, it's based on pattern recognition. And this is so nefarious in the courtroom because pattern recognition is a very fundamental primitive brain activity that we share with all kinds of, you know, other animals and stuff. It's related to our threat recognition systems. And the idea is that you know, we're, we're very good for survival purposes at being, t- being able to um, recognize patterns in order to keep us safe. So we know, you know, hey, I, if I ate this berry, I'm going to die. Um, that shadow over there is a tiger as opposed to this shadow over here is, you know, something safe. And so these instincts are, they, they have evolved to operate extremely quickly and at a sub-rational process. So this whole thing about let's get all of these accusers together and have them this, have them tell the same type of story that is attempting to hijack that logical process. And it, it is very, very effective. It's creating the perception of a pattern that will trigger people to then see that as a threat without realizing that, you know, on a logical level, these these accusations are they don't corroborate anything you know they just corroborate that multiple people are saying the same thing um but because they are saying the same thing it will naturally lead people to conclude that actually they are corroborating each other and that that's a really good case Mm. i see now you said something about the journal earlier you said that it might have been a bad are you or you implied it might have been a bad move uh, for Evan Rachel Wood to to bring out this journal because now Marilyn Manson might have access to it and discovery. Is that what you were saying? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, uh, he, he would be, he would, I, I'm sure that that would be one of the first things he would go for is her journals. Um, in the course of the filming, she's placing these journals, you know, in a folder with all k- kinds of other documentation, <laughs> you know, so there's all this stuff that you see that they are, you know, depicting as like they're working busily making this case and all of that now. Okay, great. Go ahead and produce all of that in discovery. Right. And then we will see how much of this documentary is actually actually legit documenting what happened and how much of it is, well, we put together some props in a set and did a performance <laughs> of making an accusation of sexual assault. That sure is what it, it felt like um, a lot of the time. Um, and now, is there any, the fact that she, that Evan Rachel Wood, at least I believe, and that is lying about uh, what happened on the set of heart shaped glasses. She claims that they had real sex and that it was rape. It was non-consensual and all that. And I, that's, I, that's not true. And I know that there are a number of people who are kind of scared to come forward, you know, and say that it's not true, but who know it's not true. There were a lot of people on set that day. There have been some people who have actually come forward, like, and said, oh, we, I, I was there and this was, it wasn't right. I just wonder, you know, that those kinds of, of lies that are just so like, I guess, obviously um, provable or disprovable. Is that a wise, is that a wise thing to being, is that a wise thing to be bringing out into the open? It seems like that would be like a really easy one for like a defamation charge or not really. Or defam- well, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what's even easier is, is when she was, uh, she made claims that people on the set were corroborating her version of events that they had come forward and agreed that what happened on the set of heart shaped glasses was, was so problematic uh, and disturbing. 
But of course, we didn't get those people themselves on camera. And the natural question is going to be great, Evan Rachel Wood, who exactly were you talking about when you identified, you know, these quote unquote corroborators? And right. so what I think, you know, you ask, is it wise? I, I mean, no, of course, it's not. It's not wise in, in the sense of it's not probably going to be helpful at the end of the day, but it's a manipulation tactic. It's a classic triangulation scheme that people who like to manipulate others will often do. You just go ahead and put it out there um, that essentially they're on your side or that they adopt a certain position or, or something like that. And it puts the onus on them to come forward. Not only, not only does it put them in a position of having to create conflict, which people are not necessarily, you know, always inclined to do, but disagreeing with somebody is, is a, is a type of conflict. Um, but also, like you pointed out, it's, it's kind of calling them out to have to come forward and, and out themselves as, you know, no, this, this is not the case. This, right. this didn't happen. So it's, it is. It's just, a, it's just a triangulation strategy that, that she thinks she's going to be able to get away with. Um, do you think that, so uh, just some, some questions about what, what would happen down the road with this lawsuit that Marilyn Manson has filed? How likely do you think it would be that this lawsuit could actually go to, he, I mean, he says he wants a jury trial, uh, mm -hmm. but how likely would you think it would be that it would actually get to that case, like to, to get to the point where like Johnny Depp is out with Amber Heard right now? It seems very likely to me, yeah. um, you, you know, there, the, so there's going to be hurdles that it has to clear. Um, we, we talked about anti-slap, but why I think that's got pretty limited application in this, in this case. Yeah, yeah. I think he has substantiated his claim of extreme and outrageous conduct, for example. Um, so that really just leaves us, you know, with, with the possibility of summary judgment. And um, that's, you know, not going to really come about until after they've gone through discovery and they know what the evidence is. So summary judgment can be granted when basically you don't have enough evidence to prove one of the, you know, essential elements of your claim. Um, we're not going to know what the evidence is, obviously, until they get to that point. But just given what we have seen so far, looks like there's going to be a pretty good likelihood that he can substantiate a lot of this stuff that, that he's claiming. So if that is the case, this is going to be a classic triable case because it's a pure dispute of fact. Did these things happen or did they not? And if it is, if it, uh, if it is a tribal case, if it does go to trial, if it goes to the same process that Johnny Depp's has, I know that Johnny Depp's, the, the, I know that the, the timeline for Johnny Depp's uh, case was very much protracted by the COVID delays and stuff. So what kind of, assuming there's no like, you know, uh, act of God or whatever interfering with things, what kind of a timeline do you think we're looking at between now and a verdict, if it goes to trial, a verdict, a judgment in the Manson case? Oh, I mean, we're, we're talking about years. We're talking about years. Even without COVID in the picture, um, California courts are notoriously bogged down. And um, we, we've actually seen that in the Johnny Depp case with the discovery litigation. Just a simple motion over, you know, can I take this person's deposition or not? You might have to wait eight, nine, 10 months to get a hearing on that. Um, and so we can expect there's going to probably be a lot of disputes in Marilyn Manson's case over, over what they can have access to and, and what they can't. Now, I'll tell you, part of the irony in this is that one of the, one of the best, I think, chances that, that he maybe has uh, to, to, to shorten that time frame is if, in fact, Ilma Gore and Evan Rachel Wood were criminally charged with any of their behavior, and if they were convicted of that criminal behavior, um, criminal cases do tend to move a lot more quickly because defendants have constitutional speedy trial rights. And so they take priority over civil cases and in scheduling and things like that. Um, if they were convicted of some type of crime as a result of what he's alleged took place in his complaint, um, that can potentially substitute for needing for him needing to have a trial on those particular issues. So mm -hmm. that can be a pretty quick and easy way to um, to get the case resolved, even potentially without needing needing a jury trial. I see. I see. Now, I know you can't exactly predict, but if 
if it did follow the sort of the expected course for a civil trial, are you thinking like two, three years? Is that what approximately? Oh yeah. I'd say, I'd say three years is probably the earliest I would expect to see anything. <laughs> well, that's good. My, uh, my husband will be really glad to know that he's got uh, <laughs> at least, at least three years of this in his future. Yeah. He said, he did say that something of that effect the other day, like how long is this going to go on? Um, so, but the criminal thing, I hear what you're saying. Like if they were arrested for some of the stuff that they've done, then that would be like a whole other, I mean, that would be, and that would be better for Manson than a civil judgment anyway. So. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That, absolutely. Um, and then I guess that, uh, I guess that Evan Rachel Wood then will, you know, will probably have to do the same deposition process that Amber Heard has, Evan and Ilma. Oh yes, absolutely. Um, one of the things I'll point out because people, people always ask about it a lot. They asked about it in uh, the Johnny Depp case has to do with pleading the fifth, you know, can they just plead the fifth and, and not have to give up any type of information? They are potentially criminally exposed, you know, based on some of these allegations. And so the answer is that yes, they can, they can plead the fifth. They can refuse to answer any types of questions about it. Um, but then that can be used against them you know, basically the jury can be told you, you get to draw negative inferences. There's a reason why, you know, they, they chose not to give up this information. In a criminal case, you're not allowed to do that because it, it's, it's your basic right. Um, but civil cases don't get nearly that type of protection. So even if they did plead the fifth, that doesn't insulate them from a trial. It's just basically denying them the opportunity to go on record with their own story. Interesting. Interesting. I just always kind of, I wonder that sometimes with some of these things, these things like some of these people like Amber Heard, I'm sure just must feel like, I just don't even want to deal with this, <laughs> but they have to. And that's, yeah. that's really where the, that, that suing, so that, that Manson suing these women just in and of itself is a kind of a, it is a kind of a retribution in a way or a punishment because now like they're going to have to deal with this shit. Oh yeah. Uh, and I've said, I've said before that the process is the punishment a lot of the times with, with litigation. Um, Mm -hmm. going through it may in fact be far more painful than the ultimate outcome it ends up being. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, anything else, anything you want to say? We kind of steered away from the documentary a little bit. Um, I guess, uh, so I guess kind of a, to a last note to end things on, I mean, just as this thing has developed and continued to, to snowball and still has a long way to go. I mean, have you, have you ever seen anything like this as a lawyer? <laughs> Or as just a person, like, I mean, you know, my people don't tend to be in this type of position, <laughs> you, you know, mine, mine haven't had the type of life successes that would <laughs> enable them to pull off this, this type of a hoax. Um, certainly on a, on a, on a smaller level, I see it all the time. Um, one of the, one of the questions I saw online was, um, it had to do with this fake FBI letter and why would she put a phone number on it for them, you know, to contact because, you know, she's basically inviting Jamie uh. Bell and his team to contact and, you know, wouldn't that, wouldn't that give up the whole game? And this is like, you know, basic bail release um, strategy that anybody who has spent a night in jail can tell you about. You just give them your baby mama's number or, you know, whoever is going to be willing to answer the phone and say, this is FBI agent so-and-so <laughs> and carry on the ruse. Um, and, you know, that, that's just, that's just, uh, that happens all the time. Um, Somebody is like, call my boss. Here's his number. It's actually his sister. Sure, you know that that is uh, not a um so yes i see little things like that um but no manufacturing a whole documentary not <laughs> normally something that i'm that i'm gonna run across one more question that just occurred to me <laughs> how much money do you think from the start of this to the end marilyn manson will have spent on lawyers and how much money do you think evan rachel wood uh will have spent on lawyers just if you just had to like gun to your head had to say Millions, millions. I mean, um, the, the thing to bear in mind is that this, this, you know, there's been a search warrant, there's been an ongoing criminal investigation um, that requires a massive amount of legal work behind the scenes that, that we don't see because there's no active court process, but it's protective stuff that they that they are needing to be doing. Um, so that's gonna that has already probably cost him, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and then once you get into, like we've seen with the Johnny Depp case, how, how these, 
cases just turn into um, mud slinging and litigating every single possible dispute that you can. It, it really, it's a war of attrition. Um, mm -hmm. Litigation is very much a war of attrition. So mm -hmm. yeah, I expect, I expect easily in the millions of dollars. Oh man, and it all could have been avoided, and Rachel Wood, if it could all, this is all like, this is all like, this is like some kind of, we're in like some kind of parallel universe right now. You know, when people talk about like, well, like in a parallel universe, I'd do something really crazy if I could. And like, we are in like a parallel universe in which Evan Rachel Wood has done some crazy stuff that was all totally unnecessary, <laughs> all totally unnecessary, but anyway. All right, well. But you have to think of it, you have to think of it from the mindset of the narcissist, and it's not necessary at all because it's critical to protect protect her self-image as somebody who would never voluntarily put on a Nazi uniform and make safe <laughs> movements. Okay. That just simply cannot be reconciled with, uh, with her ego and her view of herself. Well, well, all right. Well, thanks so much for being on and, uh, we'll have you on obviously again, really soon. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Goodbye. <laughs>